Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Jakarta Amani, Executive Director of the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights. Jakarta has led the center in successful campaigns to uplift communities of color, produce green jobs, and replace youth incarceration with rehabilitation programs. Prior to his work for the Ella Baker Center, he led other nonprofits focused on issues of poverty and justice. The Ella Baker Center offers a variety of programs for communities often viewed as, quote, the problem, and its programs have been so successful that it has spun off a range of other nonprofits that function independently. Jakarta has generously agreed to share some of his experiences with us, and I'd like to thank you, Jakarta, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Youth and incarceration, youth and violence, indeed, youth and our burgeoning prison population in uh, California. Talk about the impetus for the organization and how you address this, this seemingly intractable problem. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. Um, you know, the Ella Baker Center uh, came out of really this need to stand up for folks who are most left behind. Uh, when our founder, Van Jones, began the Ella Baker Center, really uh, the, there was this problem of police, uh, police violence uh, in communities where people were routinely brutalized, young people in particular, standing on street corners, hanging out at parties in and around the Bay Area, and, and in fact, throughout the, the country. Um, and a lot of traditional civil rights leaders had backed away from this because of the war on drugs. They had seen that sort of drugs were flooding into low-income communities and communities of color, and they didn't want to be any part of that. And to be fair to the, to the officers, they're, they're confronted with an intractable situation as well. They're given this task to perform. There's a lot of fear uh, around this, this whole process of interacting with communities that, that are uh, encased very often in violence and poverty and, and some of the issues on, on the urban side. Yeah, I mean, of, often these officers are completely unprepared for uh, being a part of these communities, completely scared of these communities, and sometimes, oftentimes make matters worse. So, you know, they come into communities where they don't know a soul, um, and then it's their job to go in and figure out who's who. And uh, what we were seeing was that young people, as, uh, particularly young people of color in whole, were being seen as, as criminals or potential criminals. Um, and so we wanted to do something about that work. We first started off doing that work with a, with a, a project called Bay Area Police Watch. Um, and out of that work, we sort of grew to understand that it wasn't just the young people being jacked up on the streets of San Francisco or the streets of L.A., but that there was actually a part of a bigger problem uh, of California's booming prison system, and that young people were, were really the, the raw material into that system, and that we needed to do something about it. And we launched a campaign called Books Not Bars to fight for as much as what we did want as, as the fight against what we saw as they're not only robbing young people of their individual future, but robbing California of its future. So did the system become an, uh, almost a supply chain um, and an indoctrination chain where people who started off on the edges were then educated into being more mainstreamed into um, uh, the, the type of counterproductive behaviors? They, they get introduced almost um, casually into environments that reinforce these counterproductive behaviors as opposed to, uh, to alternatives to those counterproductive behaviors. I would frame it slightly differently, okay. that young people who are, uh, find themselves pulled into the criminal justice system, uh, upon return, their options are fewer and fewer. Their options are severely limited, particularly for young people if you are incarcerated even at the local level for six months awaiting trial or awaiting placement or taken out of your home, you return to school and you're six months behind. All your friends have graduated or moved on to the next grade and you're back in a, right, and sometimes you can't go back to the school that you're attending. Sometimes you're taken out of your home. So your entire support system, your entire world is turned upside down. You're given very little resources to deal with it and you're told to go figure it out. And the resources were invested in this process as opposed to creating other opportunities for, for, for this youth. Uh, consistently. What we've seen is that, you know, uh, instead of funneling those resources into the strengthening that family or that community, they're funneled into institutions which suck up more resources. So now California spends $11 billion a year uh, incarcerating people in the state of California. And so we spend $216,000 per youth and $50,000 per adult to keep them incarcerated. At the same time, for a high school student, your kids or your viewers' children, uh, 
they'll spend less than $10,000 a year to educate them. That's just out of whack priorities. And so Books Not Bars was brought into existence to actually tackle that problem, to reverse that trade-off. Um, and it's been you know, somewhat successful because when you tell people, look, we're adding damage to damage, we're actually not helping these children, we're spending your hard-earned tax dollars to harm these children, to lock them in cages for 23 hours a day, um, to deny them visits to their families, uh, you know, taking them miles and miles away from home, and oftentimes they get out worse than when they went in, uh, suffering post-traumatic stress uh, on medication that their family can't afford to deal with that stress or to deal with other things that have emerged during their time of incarceration. You're talking both in terms of principle and ideals, but you're also talking in terms of practical results. I mean, mm. you're looking at this and you're saying, you know, in, in an ideal world, this is probably not the way it should function, but in the real world, it's, it's completely dysfunctional and you have the numbers to show it. You know, two-thirds of the people incarcerated in the state of California are people of color. Over 50% of them are Latino. Latinos don't make up 50% of the state of California. Black people don't make up 25 or 30% of the state of California, yet we do the prison system. And so who's punished for crimes has almost nothing to do with who commits crimes. Those things are absolutely unrelated. And so uh, we are trying to make them somewhat related, that you shouldn't punish people, one, out of whack with what they did, and two, really as a matter of public safety, we should make sure people return to their communities better off than when they left with more options about what to do with their lives, with, with a brighter future, so that they don't have to go back into the underground economy if that's where they came from, so that they don't have to go back into precarious situations, but they actually enter into um, a, a whole thriving community that has a place for them. Because that's, that's what any of us would want for our children who made a mistake. We have um, literally thousands and thousands of people in jail serving time for, for simple possession of a, of a, of a narcotic substance. Um, a very rich, wealthy radio uh, announcer named Rush Limbaugh had an admitted drug problem, had a drug, illicit drugs with him. Uh, he didn't go to prison. He didn't serve a day in jail. He got treatment. He got treatment. So we know what works. It's just who we're willing to do it for. And part of it is that it's such a class and such a race criminal justice system that it actually isn't just, that it, it systematically uh, produces injustices. Um, the poorer you are and the browner you are. Are you uh, basically informed by the body politics surrounding race and poverty on a global scale, and then you take those ideas and bring them down to earth in, in Oakland yeah. um, to implement those programs in, in particular ways that benefit the people of Oakland? Yeah, and, and the people of the state of California. So we're a statewide organization that uh, 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 runs, statewide pol runs statewide policy campaigns. And so uh, not only do, does our, is our work informed by what's happening globally and the sort of the, the problems that the human family is facing more broadly, um, it's, it's, it's you know, that old sort of quaint saying of uh, think globally and act locally. Uh, so for us, you know, California is our home. Um, we're based here. And, so, and we believe that just like we led the way in terms of cleaning up the air, in terms of setting uh, fuel standards for cars and pollution standards for cars. Like California, you know, it's the eighth biggest economy in the world. Mm -hmm. If we make a green turn and decide that we're gonna build a clean green future and not just build bridges and highways to nowhere, if we decide that we're gonna put low-income folks in communities of color first, given that that's the majority of Californians and we wanna see them do well and thrive, well, we can set a global agenda in that way. Yeah. Um, in terms of, of your programs, Talk about your programs and talk about how you approach uh, addressing these, these issues. We're named after Ella Jo Baker, who's one of the unsung heroes of the Civil Rights Movement. And uh, what she did was she really mentored and, and guided the young folks who, who started out during the sit-ins in the 60s in the, in the Deep South. Um, and she provided those young people uh, the space and the resources and support to develop themselves as leaders of the Civil Rights Movement. Um, and those young people help inspire a movement that transformed the world. I mean, you know, the United States now has a black president because of them sitting down at a lunch counter, uh, you know, up, um, up 10 years ago. And so we try to keep her legacy alive by offering people in our community the skills and the opportunities to work together to strengthen our community so we all can thrive. So in our juvenile justice work, we organize families of incarcerated youth to help them have a voice in helping to make sure their young people get the most support they possibly can get and that they get to come home to healthy communities. Um, you know, in our green collar jobs work, 
we were one of the first organizations to really call for um, having low-income folks, communities of color, be at the center of creating a thriving green economy. So we've worked for a number of years with the state legislature here to get them invested in not only green job training, but to invest in um, the actual uh, uh, creating renewable energy alternatives um, so that we can actually build a, a clean energy economy again in California that's based on renewable, uh, local, uh, uh, site-generated uh, energy. And so that it actually puts that in the hands of consumers and puts that in the hands of consumers a as investors. So right now we're actually piloting this incredible program in Oakland where we're uh, using the community to crowdsource the funding for community solar. So we're installing solar panels on community centers, schools, churches, and the community is actually paying for it um, through $100 increments that they will earn back over, uh, over five years. They'll get that money back in their pockets, um, which is a very exciting. So you're crowdsourcing an investment um, and, and then the, the, um, the return on that investment comes from the energy that is generated? Comes from the energy that is generated um, at, uh, in, in community buildings that are also going to use that energy. And those community buildings then get a lower uh, energy price. They get to buy the energy cheaper right. from their actual uh, the solar array on their building. Um, and their profit, the, the, the money that's made is split. Some of it goes back to pay for the initial investment. Mm -hmm. And then it goes back to the investors who are community, who are community people, right? It's a triple win. It takes, you know, we're not put it, putting carbon up in the air, which helps cool the planet. Uh, they actually, you know, the Youth Uprising is one of our partners who they provide these incredible services to people, in, uh, young people in East Oakland, pay an exorbitant amount of energy because they have this wonderful big site. Um, they get a lower energy bill, and then the people who are locally there get their investment back. Um, and so it's just, it's just amazing, and we're super, we're super excited about that and want to see this become a statewide program and, and eventually a national model. What other programs do you uh, sponsor? So locally, uh, we have a, a campaign called Soul of the City, which is really uh, um, meant to uh, put the, the future of Oakland back in the hands of its residents. We think that democracy is absolutely fundamentally important, and not just a, a once every four year or once every two year occurrence, but it's actually a daily occurrence. Civic engagement. 100%. And so um, we do this in, in three unique ways. One is through a half day training called uh, Reclaim the Future, which is a uh, a full-on multimedia experience that talks about where where are we in cities right now on the trajectory of um, social justice, uh, spiritual connection, shared prosperity, and sustainable ecology, and really looking at the crises that exist in the human families. That there are more humans on the planet than ever before, and we're more isolated and separated than ever before with more communication technology, right? Um, and, and what is that contradiction, and how do we heal that contradiction? And then I, I, again, on, on terms of the environment, all leading people towards that the solution is really inside of them, that the solution is really in our hands, that we, we live in a thriving democracy and that we are the, the lifeblood and the source of that democracy. And so that there are things that we have to do to, to, make our, to strengthen our own community and our country and indeed the world. And then we do quarterly service days where we do service, uh, community service or community solutions, that everything doesn't have to be a giant uh, community or, or a government initiative, that there's, you know, there's a dirty lot on the corner, let's, we'll let's go clean, clean it, up. it up, right? Uh, we did a, an actual incredible tree planting with one of our community partners in West Oakland, which suffers a great deal from air pollution and asthma rates and cancer clusters associated with the port and the freeways that run through that community. So we planted trees in that community, over 150 trees, um, to pull carbon out of the air to reduce global warming and to clean the air for the people who live there. Um, and that, we didn't need, you know, we didn't need government or, you know, public support for that. We just did it. This is basic community organizing. 101. 101. Is, <laughs> is bringing the community in to do it's it. Taking the community organizing philosophy that was developed during a political movement mm -hmm. and creating out of that uh, a combination of, of education, of civic engagement programs, mm -hmm. of sort of very practical approaches to solving problems like a dirty lot. A hundred percent. How does the community interact with you? Do you, do you end up um, reaching out proactively? Do you have a, a center that, that invites community interaction? Yeah, uh, some both. So we do a, a ton of public events uh, in the Bay Area, around the state, uh, you know, Stockton, Los Angeles, um, um, in the Inland Empire, Sacramento. So, you know, we, we, we do uh, public events all over the state. But then we also have um, people come to us and we do community events in our space. And um, 
and we do these things called, we, we call solution salons, where we bring people together to talk about what are the solutions. And you know, that there's so many of the solutions to the, the, the problems that face our community are right there in our own backyard, and people don't know about them. So we get those folks together and talk about the issues and talk about what they're doing, and then to look at well, what are the opportunities to bring this stuff together? What are the opportunities for legislators at the local or at the state or even the federal level to figure this stuff out? And so that has had tremendous impact. You know, we started out doing those things uh, five years ago um, around our Green College Jobs campaign. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the time, Speaker Pelosi, some of her people came to one of them, heard about it, invited our founder, at, 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 and at the time, our ED, Van Jones, to come meet with the, with the speaker. He told her about this idea that we were doing in Oakland with green collar jobs. She said, that's brilliant. Uh, introduced him to, at the time, uh, Congresswoman Hilda Solis, who's now the Secretary of Labor. She introduced a bill to do green jobs training uh, for $125 million, $25 million just for low income folks and people uh, with barriers to employment to get that training. And it was signed by then sitting George W. Bush, uh, President of the United States, this green jobs bill. It came out of these little community meetings in Oakland. Now, green jobs training is one thing, but actually converting that into a job is another thing. How, how is that going? Uh, we've seen that actually during the recession in California, that the green economy has been one, one of the only bright spots, continued to grow because there's so much room. Because not only is renewable energy good for the planet, when you figure it out, it's cheaper, right? When you can actually put solar panels on top of a building, that's cheaper energy than piping it from someplace else. The challenges we have in California and in a lot of the nation is that the, the energy companies have a lock on the market. So if you're a producer in Nevada and you have a natural f uh, gas-fired power plant, they'll buy energy from you at market rate. If this very hotel we're in put up a thousand solar panels on its roof and could then sell energy back into the grid, they wouldn't give them a dime. They would just let their meter spin backwards and when it got to zero, they would say, well, you know, good luck, we'll see you again next month. But, they, but if they did that, this hotel would be passively making biz money, right? Um, uh, certainly schools would actually turn into these huge money generating things for the school districts because they have these giant flat roofs that you, you could put solar panels on, on top of that would, and sell money back to the grid, sell inter, excuse me, energy back to the grid when energy is most expensive in the middle of the day during the summer when that school is not using a drop of energy because all the kids are at home. So your point is that, is that by, um, by addressing these various problems that we all have, whether it's uh, incarceration and the, the, the burgeoning uh, prison population, um, core issues surrounding the cost of energy, um, core issues in terms of, of where investment dollars flow to, to um, have the biggest impact on our society, what you're in a struggle for is appropriate investment that's right. To solve problems that, in a way that is evidence-based. And are problems that we all face, right? That, that I'm, I'm not talking about problems that, that, that are sort of like some special interest groups problems. You know, what to do with California's tax dollars. That's, our, that's, our, that's all it's of our, our problem. problem. It's all of our problem. You know, in California's current budget, uh, they reduced K-12 through education by over a billion dollars and grew correction spending by four billion. So that money came out of uh, in-home care support they're going to provide to you, you and my parents as they get older. That money came out of the libraries and parks and education, and it went into corrections. It's a closed pie. One slice gets bigger, the other slices get smaller. Exactly. There's no, there's no other way to go about it. And that impacts us all, no matter what your issues are, no matter what you're concerned about. Education, environment, health, whatever you think. You, criminal justice ain't your issue at all. That's right. There shouldn't be. But the, the money that our state's spending on it should be. When people said, you know, when, when my people were doing predatory lending stuff and, and the low-income communities are doing that work, people said, well, that's just y'all's issue and whatever, and then it crashed the whole economy. So what we're discovering is it's a closed system, and what you do on one part of it impacts the whole. And so that's really what we want to bring to uh, the state of California, what we want to bring to the country and indeed the world, is that that's why we have to be attentive to all these issues and look for problems, uh, I'm sorry, look for solutions to problems that really... Um, solve them in a way that has ancillary benefit for everybody. That if we solve these things just at their level, if we just say, oh, we should just lock up fewer children, or uh, we should just put more money into parks, or more money into education, or what, if you don't solve them in a systemic way, uh, you actually can end up causing more problems, right? Because this whole idea of that we're gonna go after 
uh, young people who are in, engaged in illegal activity or we're going to go after the violence or the drugs in low-income communities. Well, look at what that's done. The state of California now spends more money locking people up than it does educating people, and that means white kids in the suburbs too. That's not just brown kids in the ghetto. And so it's like, well, I don't know, that's not my problem, except it is. When the pools close this summer because of budget cuts, but the prison's open, that's, that's, that's what we're dealing with, and we can fix that. Well, thank you so much, Jakarta, for, Sunday, for uh, sharing your experiences with us, and, and thank you so much for your insights. Thank you much for having me. Thanks.